Hello and welcome to another Royal Reviewer channel episode and today I'm going to be sharing with you a selection of new books to the market. Just to explain, all of these books are published by Pen and Sword Books. They are most they are mostly historical works and I think you will absolutely love them. Pen and Sword reached out to me and said that I could choose a selection of books to share with my viewers. So that's exactly what I have done. I have selected some that I am really, really interested in. Having only received them two days ago, I have not had a full chance to read from cover to cover all of the books. So that is not what this video is about. This is about showcasing what books are out there that I think you will be interested in. I have provided links to all of these books in the description box below from Pen and Sword directly and if available from Amazon. So of course if you are interested do go and check them out. Okay I think we should start with the first book which is called Living in Medieval England The Turbulent Year of 1326 by Catherine Warner. Now if I show you the cover here you will of course see all of the beautiful detail. So why did this book make my selection? Well, as you know, I like history and I like history from way back when. So living in medieval England kind of piqued my interest because I want to know what was it like living in medieval England? I have watched programs on certain things over the years. I've read things in books, but I want to know specifically what it was like to live in medieval England. Now, if I read a little bit of the inside cover, 1326 was one of the most dramatic years in English history. The Queen of England, Isabella of France, invaded the country with an army of mercenaries to destroy her husband's powerful and detested lover, Hugh Dispenser the Younger, and brought down her husband, King Edward II, in the process. It was also a year, however, when the majority of English people carried on living their normal, ordinary lives. Elaine Glassrate ran her own successful glassmaking business in London. Jack Cressing, the master carpenter, repaired the beams in the tower of Kenilworth Castle. Alice Coleman sold her best ale at a penny and a half for a gallon in Byfleet. And Will Mulwood made the king laugh greatly when he spent time with him at a wedding in Marlborough. England sweltered in one of the hottest, driest summers of the Middle Ages. A whale washed ashore at Walton on the Naze, and the unfortunate John Tolley died when he relieved himself out of the window of his London house at midnight and lost his balance. Oh my goodness. Living in medieval England, the turbulent year of 1326 tells the true and fascinating stories of the men and women alive in England in this most eventful year narrated chronologically with a chapter devoted to each month. And if I turn to the chapter selection, yeah, you can definitely see it goes January, February, March, April, May. Now, the one thing that I really, really like from the description of this book, it is not just about the kings and queens and the prominent people of the day. It's actually about normal, regular English people, the stories that we may not have heard. So I'm expecting a few gems to be revealed in here, just things that you just wouldn't normally learn from the history books about kings and queens and that kind of thing. That is why I selected this one. And if that appeals to you, go and check it out. Next on my list is a book about my favourite queen. I mean, I'm sure we all have our own favourite monarchs, but The Making of a Queen, Queen Elizabeth I. I have read other books in the past about Elizabeth I, but historians often find new and interesting things when they come to light. So I want to know more about Elizabeth. This book explores the life of Elizabeth I, both before and after she ascended the throne. It examines how her early life shaped the monarch she became, looks at Elizabeth in her roles as queen, politician and woman, and focuses on some of the key women surrounding her, that should be interesting, including her mother Anne Boleyn, her stepmother Catherine Parr, Lady Jane Grey and Mary I. It compares the differing styles of queenship in the 16th century, with particular emphasis placed on Mary I and Mary Queen of Scots. 
um, all figures again that I am really interested in because they of course surround Elizabeth. So Elizabeth I is arguably one of the greatest monarchs that ever lived, I completely agree, against an uncertain political and religious backdrop of post-Reformation Europe, she ruled at the conception of social modernisation, living in the shadow of the infamy of her parents' reputations and striving to prove herself an equal to the monarchs who had gone before her. This book seeks to explore some of the key events of her life, both before and after she ascended the English throne in late 1558, by looking at the history of these selected events, as well as investigating the influence of various people in her life. This book sets out to explain Elizabeth's decisions, both as a queen and as a woman. Amongst the events examined are the death of her mother, the role and fates of her stepmothers, the fate of Lady Jane Grey and the subsequent behaviour and reign of her half-sister Mary. Along with the death of Amy Dudley, the return of Mary Queen of Scots to Scotland, the Papal Bull and the Spanish Armada. This book does look set to be uh, a really, really thoroughly good read. This is the one. If you're interested, do go and check out the links below. Next on my list, and I'm sure you can see I've put them in chronological order, um, is Cromwell's Failed State and the Monarchy. Now, I have never actually read a book in full, in detail, on Cromwell and in particular about how his actions in bringing down the monarchy affected the state. So I'm hoping that that is what this book will deliver. There yeah, you can see the front cover of that and it is by author Timothy Venning. Let's take a look at what it says about this. Regicide, military dictatorship, war and rumours of war, opposition from all sides and collapse of a failed state such as the story of Oliver Cromwell's unique experiment in the governance of Britain following the English-British civil wars. The British state of the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland were united in the Protectorate, with Cromwell as Lord Protector, 1649 to 1660, but also collapsed with the restoration of the Stuart dynasty. This book covers the chaotic aftermath of the end of the civil wars and how Cromwell set up his new Protectorate to replace the failed state. This book, as you can see, is fairly sizable. Let's just do a page count from when the pages pick off. So it actually has 318 pages and the print is fairly small. So there is a lot of detail in this book. And yes, this is one that I am most definitely looking forward to reading because I don't know terribly too much about this period. The next one that I am looking to read is about Charles II. And this one's called His Escape Into Exile, Capture the King by Martin R. Beardsley. And again, I'll let you look at the colour of that. So this is the story of Charles II and his famous escape into exile. Read of the invaluable help provided by the five trusty Pendrel brothers who sheltered Charles, provided his disguise and taught him to walk and talk like a Shropshire countryman. That appears to me because I am from Shropshire um, and I have actually visited Boscobel House where he climbed into the tree and hid. I visited as a child and I, when I had a quick look through, I did actually see a picture. There is a chapter on Boscobel House. So this book intrigues me because it talks about places that I have been to and of course explores the area in which I live in. From being chased in the night by a suspicious miller and the enemy soldiers who were quartered with him, to hiding in an oak tree while local militia searched the surrounding woods. That's what I was talking about. Martin Beardsley regales the reader with the episodes in the life of a future king. Jane Lane, Lady Fisher, played a pivotal role in the escape. The possible relationship between her and Charles is explored here. The ramifications and legacy of this famous escape are also investigated. Again, this book seems to be full of really, really detailed information. Uh, there are maps in the pictures. Uh, there are also some black and white photos too. So again, a link will be provided to all of these books in the description. Next, a place of which I have visited uh, about three or four years ago, maybe four years ago, A Hidden History of the Tower of London. I do love the Tower of London. It's really amazing when you go there. It's a really great tourist attraction. If you are in London, do go. Um, this book is by John Paul Davies and it's England's most notorious prisoners. So this focuses 
on the tower's most notorious prisoners. So I imagine it will probably include Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth I, we'll see. The Tower of London is an iconic building, having held many famous prisoners since it was first built in the reign of William the Conqueror. Inspired by new research, that's what I was saying, lots of times new research comes out. So even if you've read books on certain characters or places in the past, new research, new investigations is being carried out all the time. So it's always good to be updated. A hidden history of the Tower of London documents the lives of the Tower's many prisoners, notably the plotters, rebels, pretenders, murderers, escapees, and those who suffered public execution. It shines a light on many of the lesser known stories and offers solutions to long unanswered questions surrounding one of Britain's most important and mysterious buildings. So I am really, really, really looking forward to reading that if I just show you the back cover as well. Okay, next, a book which I don't know whether it will appeal to you or not, but it appealed to me because I want to know more about this subject. So this is Sex and Sexuality in Victorian Britain by Violet Fenn. And if I show you the cover, um, sexuality was, has been, has always been a big, big part of history and how different eras responded to sexuality is always interesting to find out about. Now we think often of the Victorians as being very stuffy, um, as not embracing sexuality. However, this book I'm sure will explore exactly the attitudes towards sexuality. It include, of course, sex, gender, um, how, how sexual relationships were thought of and, and spoke about, or rather not spoke about, as the case may be, of, like I said, sexuality, the issue of being gay, of being lesbian. I think this is all explored here when I had a quick look through. So, everything you could ever want to know about sex in Victorian Britain shows how attitudes to male and female sexual behaviour were often determined by those in positions of power and authority. An affectionate, informative and fascinating look at sex and sexuality during the reign of Queen Victoria. So yeah, I'm very interested in this one. Peek beneath the bedsheets of 19th century Britain in this affectionate, informative and fascinating look at sex and sexuality during the reign of Queen Victoria. It examines the prevailing attitudes towards male and female sexual behaviours and the ways in which these attitudes were often determined by those in positions of power and authority. It also explores our ancestors' ingenious, surprising, bizarre and often entertaining solutions to the challenges associated with maintaining a healthy sex life. I'm intrigued. Did the people of Victorian times live up to their stereotypes when it came to sexual behaviour? We'll find out. This book will answer this question as well as looking at fashion, food, science, art, medicine, magic, literature, love, politics, faith and superstition through a new lens, leaving the reader uplifted and with a new regard for the ingenuity and character of our great great grandparents. I'm thoroughly looking forward to reading this book. Um, as you can see, it is 115 pages and the print is fairly small. So there is a lot packed into this book. Um, so if this piques your interest and you are as intrigued as I, then do check out the links. And lastly, but not least, one of our favourite authors, Dickens. And this follows Dickens, of course, at Christmas. Now, I will probably put this one on the back shelf until roughly November. November is when I start to feel really, really Christmassy. But um, I, I always like reading Christmas themed books at Christmas. Um, I mean, just look at the illustration on that one. I think it's really detailed and a beautiful, beautiful book slip. This new book, written by one of his direct descendants, explores not only Dickens's most famous work, but also his all too often overlooked over Christmas novellas. It takes the readers through the seasonal short stories he wrote for both adults and children, includes much loved festive excerpts from his novels, uses contemporary newspaper clippings and looks at Christmas writings by Dickens' contemporaries. To give an even more personal insight, readers can discover how Dickens' family itself celebrated Christmas through the eyes of Dickens' unfinished autobiography, 
family letters and his children's memories. I am so looking forward to reading this book at Christmas time and I really, really hope if you are into Christmas like I am, that you will too. There we have it, a look at a selection of new books published by Pen and Sword. If you are interested in any of them, please do take a look at the links below. I hope you have enjoyed this video and found this collection of books that I have personally selected from Pen and Sword to be of interest to you. So if you have enjoyed this video, please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to share on social media and also do hit the bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. Also, please do remember to subscribe to the channel. So from me, in Shropshire, to you all and goodbye.